Hello, friends, and welcome back to Malicious Compliance Stories. Let's start with a story from the trenches of retail, a world where policies often clash with public patience. But before we begin, best way to support our channel is to leave comments, like, and subscribe with a turned-on bell so you don't miss the new video every single day. Here we go. Sir, I need to see your ID. This happened years ago during my retail days. Some of the details are a little fuzzy, so sorry in advance. The company I worked for had a variety of annoying policies, one of which being if a customer wants to buy alcohol, you as the cashier are required to check their ID. Doesn't matter how young or old they look, no ID, no booze. The register will actually block you from proceeding with the transaction without entering in their birth date. Most people laughed it off. Older women always became so giddy and flattered. Can't tell you how many times I've heard, I haven't been carded in decades. However, some people thought it was absurd that I would have the audacity to ask them. I'd usually just shrug, then point to the sign we had by the registers that stated the policy. People would often complain about how dumb of a rule that was, but then just do it because why fight? Not always, though. One day, a white guy in maybe his late 50s walks up to my register with his two sons. Both look to be in their early 20s. I greeted them and in my retail voice asked them if their shopping experience was pleasant today. Older guy kind of mumbles something about it being fine enough, then places some beer on the counter. I scan the first one. Register asks for birth date. I ask the gentleman to see his ID to verify age. Keep in mind he clearly is of age. He did not like me asking this though. Excuse me, but why the hell do you want to see my ID? Store policy, sorry. My gray hairs are enough of an ID. Are you effing stupid? To be honest, this was the first time I'd ever had a customer swear at me, so I was a little caught off guard. I pointed to the sign stating the policy. This sent him into a major hissy fit, screaming about how dare I ask him and you're just a B, aren't you? The two younger guys looked absolutely mortified. At this point, I'm thinking, dude, I don't get paid enough to deal with whatever's going on with you, so I called my supervisor up to talk to him. Supervisor gets to the register, asks what's going on. This idiot's telling me I need ID to buy my beer. Yes, that's company policy. She's doing her job correctly and responsibly by asking you. Sorry for your inconvenience, sir. At this point, the guy picks up one of the bottles of beer and smashes it on the ground, then storms out. One of the younger guys follows him out immediately. The other waits a moment before telling me that his dad doesn't carry his ID with him because he's old enough that he doesn't need to do that, despite that breaking the law because you're supposed to always carry your license when you drive. Anyway, that was a fun day. I guess you got to take an extra long break that day. I don't miss retail. How hard is it to carry your driver's license? WTF. Guy's older, but has the personality of a toddler. And our second story. Happy to oblige. I'm usually not a reactive person. Last night I was. Went to see a movie with the girlfriend last night, and the movie was awesome. Walking out of the theater later on after the movie, me and my girlfriend were quick to notice a small parking spot war had ensued behind her car. Looked to me like two young men, each in their own car, were battling for the space that my girlfriend was soon to vacate. I helped her load the last of her stuff into her car and went to walk across the lot to my Jeep. As soon as I got seated and my engine started, I looked at my girlfriend and she was still in the space. Half backed out of it with both of those cars jammed in behind her. These guys were having a standoff feet behind her car over a front parking space. I drove around and got out of my car. I was livid here and yelled at both of them to move so she could leave and they could continue their BS fight. One guy rolled down his window to protest he was here first and that the other guy was being a jerk. Whatever, not my issue. I just wanted us both to leave and let them have their fight. The second car said nothing. I stormed back to my Jeep and waited for my girlfriend to leave. She squeezed her way out and drove over to Dutch Brothers across the street to say hey to her coworkers. I was still near the other two guys after she left. I rolled down my window and yelled at the guy in the second car for being so stupid and making her feel like she couldn't leave it all over a stupid space. I was angry at this point. The guy stopped his car as he was halfway backed into the space that he had won and got out. 
He stood up, and his first words to me were, Get out of your car, then let's go. I guess he wanted to fight over this. Not worth it, I thought to myself. I'm not going to fight you over something so petty, dude, I shouted back in anger. Next time, learn to be patient for five minutes before acting like a total idiot. This flared him up as he had his girlfriend in the passenger seat. I could see the king penguin flare his chest out. What came next was a verbal barrage unlike any I've ever heard before. I like to think I know a lot of nasty words, but this guy was educating me on some other type of level. If you want me to move so bad, then move my car yourself. He would regret asking this of me later. Racial slurs followed by such vulgar and nasty speech, I was in total shock that a human could speak this way to someone else over a parking spot. <laughs> I drove away and really just didn't want to argue with him any longer. I guess I was the loser in that situation, but honestly, it just didn't seem worth it. As I drove away, he shouted one last phrase at me. That's right, run away, you bee. I was shocked. It's sad to see young men act this way. What was even more lame was the fact that a family of five was walking about 12 feet away out of the theater with their three little girls. I snapped. I kept driving and went over to the next parking lot. I sat about 200 yards away with my car running for about five minutes, watched him park his car, and walk inside with his girlfriend. So I made a choice to retaliate just a bit. You can tell me I was wrong for doing this, and honestly, I think I'll agree with you on that. But my gosh, did it feel so good. I pulled off to an empty spot and got out of my Jeep. I pulled my front bumper winch into neutral and spooled out about six feet of cable, tossed the loose cable, and drove over to his crappy Honda. Nobody was in the lot, thus nobody was in danger. I checked my surroundings, hooked the hook to the cable and the tow hook under his front bumper. This ensured no damage to his car in any way. I put the Jeep in four low and slowly backed up. When I left, his car was in the middle of the road. Cars could still get by, but they'd need to go around about 70 yards. I don't know what happened after that. My guess is an employee probably had to go find this guy and get him to move. Otherwise, he got towed. Was I right to move his car? No. But technically, he did ask me to move his car myself. And I was oh so happy to oblige. And our next story. You want to see it yourself? Fine. Not me, but literally just went down at the restaurant I'm eating at. Having breakfast with friends at a specialty waffle place. Service is obscenely slow, but whatever. A lady who is very obviously the owner comes in through the front door and starts in on the two employees. What seems to be the problem? When we turned on the second iron this morning, spark shot out the bottom and it made a loud pop. Is it working? Looks like it's unplugged. We unplugged it to be safe. I don't understand. There doesn't seem to be anything wrong with it. I can't send it out for repair if I can't tell them what's wrong with it. The employee looked her dead in the eyes, reached under the counter, and plugged it back in, then took a step back, and from what I can tell, used the handle of a broom to hit the on switch. There was a sound like a shotgun going off and the distinct sound of electrical arcing with a giant plume of black smoke. Every single patron in the restaurant jumped in their seat, shortly followed by me laughing so hard I couldn't breathe. I can still smell the residual burnt ozone smell as I finish my waffle and type this. I learned a new phrase, burnt ozone, which is described as the smell of hot electrical slash electronic equipment. And our last story. Karen <laughs> pretends in court that my house belongs to HOA. My mother divorced my father when I was just three years old. Since then, I've had three stepfathers, and my mother had four more children with different men. Throughout my childhood, I lived in abundance, even though my mother never worked, sustaining herself on stock she received from my biological father's divorce settlement. All the while, I heard tales of how terrible and unreliable he was, which kept me from contacting him until his death. I also never connected with my paternal grandparents, as my mother always had reasons to paint them as bad people. After my father's death, I inherited a significant fortune and discovered I had a brother from my father's side. My father had two houses, leaving one to me and the other to my brother. It was then I began to see another side of the story. My brother introduced me to our grandparents properly, and they turned out to be wonderful people. I realized my father was much like them, 
but my mother's grudges had clouded my view. Furthermore, I learned that during the divorce, my father left nearly all his money to my mother, intending it for me. I'm still angry with her for deceiving me all these years. But this story isn't about that. It's about the house I inherited from my father. What could possibly go wrong, right? Well, everything did. The local homeowners association decided my home should be part of their empire. Within a month, I received a notice stating that my house was under their jurisdiction and I was to start paying dues. To add insult to injury, they claimed to have discovered documents proving their right to my home. Representatives from the homeowners association began showing up at my doorstep with demands and documents asserting that my new home was now part of their territory. The first alarm rang when the association's chairman, a man in his 50s with a triumphant look, brought me a stack of papers clearly stating that my house was under their service. See here, everything's clearly stated. Your home at 42 Push Street is transferred to us, so start paying the dues, he said, pushing the papers towards me. Are you sure this is my house, I asked, scrutinizing documents that seemed too fresh for such a transaction. Absolutely, he smiled as if he already saw me counting out bills. The more I examined the documents, the more doubts arose. Oddities in the text, like a clearly reprinted date and signature that looked like copies, made me suspicious. Deciding not to waste any time, I hired a lawyer, John, a young real estate specialist, spent days dissecting every page, every line. Look here, John pointed to one of the pages. This document claims that your house was included in the Homeowners Association five years ago. But I have official records from the registry where your house isn't mentioned as part of the Homeowners Association at all. It seems someone tried very hard to drag you into this. Realizing the evidence was non-existent on their side, the homeowners association representatives didn't back down. They decided the best course was to take it to court, probably thinking I would get scared and just give in. They were clearly mistaken. When it came to court, I already had a full portfolio of evidence proving that my house had never been part of the homeowners association. My lawyer presented all the facts confidently, and it soon became clear that the Homeowners Association's attempt to use fabricated documents against me had backfired. When the court confirmed that the Homeowners Association documents were forgeries, my lawyer, John, suggested a next step. See, they seriously crossed the line using fake papers. We can file a counterclaim for fraud. This will not only help you achieve justice, but also protect others from similar actions in the future. We took his advice and filed a counterclaim. It took time and effort, but it all ended well. The court found the Homeowners Association actions fraudulent and decided I was entitled to a significant compensation for their attempts to unlawfully interfere with my property rights and for all the stress I had endured. The court also ruled that the Homeowners Association must pay all legal fees for both cases. How illiterate do you have to be to think someone would fall for such a stupid stunt with fake documents? Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.